First on the agenda is Idaho State University. President Satterley, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Mr. We're glad you made the long journey and that you're here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll turn the time over to you for, for some remarks to begin the process here today, and, and then we'll move into to the budget. President Satterley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Joint Committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address you this morning on behalf of Idaho State University. And from all of our students who you support every day with your work, please let me thank you for those efforts. In 2012, which is just six academic years ago, which is a short time in higher education, Idaho began in earnest its implementation of Complete College Idaho and other best practices and student success programs. Since then, you've generously supported the Complete College Idaho initiatives at Idaho State University, including light item support for our Bengal Bridge program, which is very successful and popular, and our Innovative Career Path Internship program and supported academic coaches. Also during the past five years, Idaho State University has implemented the 15 to finish, our tuition lock initiative, uh, a degree audit system with academic pathways, all of these being best strategies from the original Complete College Idaho program. So as we completed our 2018 academic year, that means we finished the six year graduation cohort that started in 2012 when these initiatives first in earnest went into implementation. Our previous cohort had a six-year graduation rate at Idaho State University of 29%, but that 2012 cohort that just finished the six-year term went up to 33%. That's a four-year increase. It's significant for those students who are to be first affected by these initiatives. That's actually great news. It means that we feel that Complete College Idaho, Complete College America, and these student success programs that you have funded are actually working. These programs are building long-term systemic changes into how we move students through the pipeline at Idaho State University. They're making a difference. They represent steady and fundamental changes, real changes in the individual lives of those students impacted by these programs. The kind of real change we can build on for the future. So progress is being made, maybe not as fast as everyone would want it to happen, but it is being made. And I want you to know I am committed to continuing that process progress towards helping students achieve their goals. But one cautionary tale, it isn't all about graduation rates. So before we get too lost in graduation rates, and instead I want to focus on the programs themselves and the good they do for students, because I want to tell a short story about two different students. One is deemed a rousing success, and the other is unfortunately a failure. The first student who came to the university with a declared major in soil biology, she went through school in four straight years, never changed her major, never varied from that path. She had seen the finish in four literature. She knew it took 15 credits a semester to finish in four. She knew she was getting a quote unquote, a four year degree. Her parents expected her to finish in four and told her they would pay for those four. And if she went beyond that, she'd have to get student loans. So she graduated in four years. Even though towards the end, she wasn't sure that was the right degree for her, she got it. With no student loans, she was set for a career in science, with the BLM or the Forest Service, or in many of the large agricultural businesses we have in Idaho. But after she finished, she realized she didn't really like any position in her field. In fact, she liked neither the science nor the soil-based work she was trained for. So right now, she currently works as a part-time teller in a bank. The other story is about a student who came to the university in her freshman year with no parental support. She eked by through her freshman year, but realized if she was going to continue going to school, it meant student loans. Instead, she got a full-time job, and she, she switched from being a full-time student and working part-time to being a full-time em employee and going to school only part-time. She took classes every semester, but continued to work full-time, but because of that, she never took out a single student loan, and seven years later, she graduated with a degree and has a job in her field. So those are my two graduates. Each has a bachelor's degree and no student loan debt. But by most standards to which the university has held, one is a success and the other is a failure. By the standard of finishing in four, the first student is a success. By the measurements that the state and the federal government has, she is our success story, the successful student who got through in four years. She's also unhappy with her degree choice, not working in her field, only working part-time, and not realizing her full potential as a student or a member of our community. 
She's considering returning to school to do something different. By state and federal measures, the other student is our failure. She not only didn't finish in four, she didn't even finish in six. She took her seven. She dropped off everybody's measuring sticks and dropped out of the system. The student who took seven years is happy with her choices. She went through college with no parental support, no student loan debt, and she did it her way. She is by every measure our failure. But she is, by my measure, <clears throat> our greatest success story. A student from rural Idaho who had no parental support, who found her path, working in a field she loves, debt-free, that is a success. A success that will not show up on our four and six year graduation rates. And in fact, a statistic that will be held against us because she didn't. Idaho State University serves the largest geographic portion of the state, if you look at southern Idaho. And that region contains most of Idaho's rural communities. And it is our mission at Idaho State University to help those students who come from small town Idaho get an education they need to better their lives. Many will be able to do it in four years, but many others will not. But that's not the point. That shouldn't be our hang up. The point is we should focus where, how do we get students into higher education and go on and then find ways to move them to completion and the time it takes is one but only one measure of that success. There's an entire population of Idaho students that if they are told to go full time and finish in four, they are more likely to stop out or drop out than they are to complete. But finding the pathway that gets them to the right place at their pace, we can help make them be a success. Balancing the costs and opportunities to make sure that they are supported, that is our goal. So while I'm excited about our efforts and I'm excited about the change in our graduation rates, to me, it's more fundamental that we are finding ways to move students through the pipeline, help them be successful. And I want to make sure we have that perspective as we measure that success. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would be remiss if I did not thank you and the Joint Committee for redirecting the $10 million of permanent building fund appropriation from the Gale Life Sciences Project to the Eames Project. As I promised, an update on the Gale Life Sciences building will be forthcoming and we will provide it as soon as it is complete. But in the meantime, we will get started on the Eames Complex changes immediately. And so for that, our students thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will gladly stand for any questions you may have. Thank you, President Satterley. <clears throat> Appreciate those two stories. And it shows to me, anyway, that we need to watch for other indicators. Is there a, is there a good way to measure that seven-year student? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think there are ways. And when we do our real longitudinal data about how our students are progressing, it's about measuring progress. And sometimes progress doesn't come in the form of just the graduation rates. The concern is always the cost. The longer they go, the more it costs. And finding ways to get them through at the lowest cost to them, but get them through at the pace that is best for them. The, the data is very complete that sometimes a student having to move through in four will lead to dropouts more often instead of the graduation, and that's the concern. So how many of those students do you think there are that are not completing, that do complete, but not necessarily in four or six? Maybe it's longer. Do you have a feel for that? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would have been much better prepared if I'd have had a number to answer that question. And <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the answer is I don't have it, but I could get it. I think we'd appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Ms. Jessup. Welcome to the committee today. We're glad to have you here. Let's start out by reviewing the 2018 uh, budget, the B12s, and, and move right through the 2018 expenditures. And perhaps we can have the, the uh, president speak to those 2018 line items when we get there. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, on page two of your packet for Idaho State University um, begins the FY18 actual expenditures for Idaho State University. I would point out that there was reverted appropriation. However, the majority of this um, reversion was in the dedicated funds. You will see 0650 um, as a fund consistently pertaining to the colleges and universities. This fund is the tuition and fees fund that is consistent with all the universities in the college. So um, 
this, these are funds that are taken in by the university. They are considered state funds, but they are reappropriated, they're, then they're appropriated back out um, with authority to the institution so they can spend those, appro those tuition and fee dollars. Mr. Chair, moving into FY 2019, I would note that there was um, two line items to, the, to Idaho State University, including um, improvements to their health sciences and workforce expansion and also occupancy costs. I would yield to the President to discuss those further. President Satterley, would you address those line items, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, <coughs> our approved funded uh, items for that year the main one being the clinical psychopharmac psychopharmacology master's degree program. As you recall, this was a workforce and industry demand and accompanied a change in the law to allow these uh, practitioners to prescribe. In order to do that, we had to increase the educational programs in Idaho. So Idaho State is delivering that. The program is being delivered out of the Skaggs Health Science Center in Meridian. We're using that line item to hire six new faculty and professional positions. The director was brought on board in December. He's a prescription trained psychologist who we are importing from Wyoming, has a strong academic background as a faculty member. Three other faculty searches uh, for a pharma, uh, PharmD, a basic science provider, and a nurse practitioner are underway. The curriculum is already fully approved. Um, has made its way through the State Board of Education. We've had lots of interest and we are admitting students now. They will start this fall. Okay. Thank you. Perfect explanations. <clears throat> Ms. Jessup. Mr. Chair, moving into FY 2020, beginning on page five of your packet, you will see that the request from Idaho State University was $150,574,400. The governor's recommendation um, was a little bit less than this at $149,268,800. Moving into the next three pa um, four pages of your packet is some additional, Mr. Chair, I stand corrected, five pages of your packet. There's some additional information about um, Idaho State University and the college and universities in general, including two um, annual resident tuition and fees, on page six, some general terms that you'll see repeatedly or hear repeatedly throughout the higher education budgets and some enroll enrollment data, but also the combined annual operating budgets for the institutions to provide a little bit of an in more insight into the fact that the, the legislature pro legislature's appropriation for higher ed is a portion of their operating budget. Um, they have many other um, sources of funding that feed into what their total budget is. And that is outlined by institution on page nine of your packet. Also on page nine is a breakout of what the primary uses of those, of those um, funds are at each of the institutions. Finally, on page 10 of your packet is an outline of the net assets that are available to each of the institutions. Um, what how many of those assets are obligated, perhaps in pending construction projects or expansion projects, but also how much is um, available to their reserve. Ms. Ms. Jessup, would you go back to page nine and would you speak under uh, sources of funds, non-appropriated funds, speak to those, those two red numbers that are there, the 5.7 million and the 1.4 million? Yes, Mr. Chair. On page, page nine of your packet, members of the committee, about halfway through, you have the original appropriation and then you also have non-appropriated, um, the non-appropriated funds. The first line there is non-cog tuition and fees. A non-cog or a non-cognizable number is a number that is recognized after legisl the legislative session ends. So these are funds that were either over and above or less than what was anticipated. Um, specifically, non-cog tuition and fees refers to money that came in over and above what was expected for tuition and fees, or maybe there was a shortcoming in what was expected in tuition and fees. Specifically for Idaho State University, you'll see that tuition and fees were $5.7 million less than what was expected. And, and I'm assuming that, that uh, that's by and large, and uh, the reason being that uh, enrollment was down by 1.7%. Mr. Chair, I would yield to the institution, but that would be, that's the correlation that I would note. There are additional details I would. President Satterley, do you have anything to add to that? 
Mr. Chairman, it's a, it's a twofold problem at Idaho State University. One is general decline in, in, in students, which is not particularly severe, but it is happening. It's one of the reasons the state, one of the top items the State Board of Education has given me to resolve. The other one is a large part, um, everyone might remember that for a time, Idaho State University admitted a, a large cohort of international students who paid a lot in fees. Um, they're going through on cohort basis, and so we're losing a set each year over the f four or five years, and this is toward coming to the end. When you put those two together, <laughs> what, uh, we have a hole in the budget on what the projected student fees are but for what we're collecting. So we're working on that. Okay, thank you, President. Ms. Jessup. Mr. Chair, moving into the FY20 budget on page um, 11 of your packet, you'll note that the Idaho State, Idaho State University did not have any um, programmatic line items. There isn't a request for occupancy costs, um, which we will get to ever so soon. On page 12 of your packet, um, Mr. Chair, um, there is reappropriate. Idaho State University did receive um, reappropriation um, in, as, in addition to the FY 2019 appro original appropriation. And there are a few adjustments there, again, based on um, enrollment and changes in faculty as far as the FTP, non-cognizable funds and transfers. Mr. Chair, moving to page 13 of your packet into the FY20 maintenance budget. Um, again, benefit costs are right at the top there. Of that total $2.8 million, a decrease of $966,500 of that amount is attributable to ISU. Um, Idaho State University did request inflationary adjustments from the general fund and the dedicated fund. The governor has recommended that those requested from the dedicated funds be appropriated, but not from general funds. Similarly, with replacement items, the governor did not include, recommend, did not include in his recommendation um, Idaho State University's request for $3.2 million in replacement items from the general fund. On regarding CEC, on page 14 of your packet, again, um, of the $11.6 million increase in CEC, $4,281,000 of that is attributable to ISU's increase in CEC. Mr. Chair, finally on page 15 of your packet for the non-discretionary adjustments, the governor has recommended an appropriation of 499,900 for ISU for non-discretionary adjustments or the enrollment workload adjustment. Addition, there are additional adjustments for endowment dollars for Idaho State University, but um, that would be it for the maintenance portion of the budget, Mr. Chair. Okay, proceed. And Mr. Chair, there is one request from ISU for occupancy costs. This is on page 18 of your packet. Um, also on that, is, on that page is the request from ISU for the budget law exemption to allow them to move money freely between the um, operate between PC and OE capital outlay. Mr. Chair, I would yield to the president for discussion of these items. President Satterley, comments on line items or anything else on your budget? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm very excited about the governor's recommendation for uh, colleges and universities. I am uh, very supportive of the uh, support outside of this budget for the op uh, Opportunity Scholarship. I appreciate that. Increased state support for scholarship for Idaho students is and always will be a concept that I support. I'm also happy with the recommendations regarding the enrollment workload adjustment and endowment increases. Both of those help fund that core mission that I spoke of earlier about moving students through the pipeline um, towards graduation, towards their goals. Our occupancy costs this year are primarily for the Meridian Cadaver Lab expansion of 85,000. This is a two-story project at the Skaggs Health Science Center. The first floor portion is a state-of-the-art laboratory and cadaver room utilizing computer-based and virtual technology applications. And on the second floor, it's project support for <coughs> ISU's nursing program and clinical research space with occupancy slated to be this June. Uh, the governor also recommended the increase in special programs and medical fields that will come up later. We support those. And we are very appreciative of the 3% CEC recommendation. That's a great benefit for our employees, and I'm in complete support of that as well. 
Thank you, President. So how will I, ISU deal with, with those employees who would receive a CEC who are not funded from the general fund? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, the university will have to make one of two choices, which is either uh, find a way to distribute the 3% across the entire or find another source of revenue to make up that so that we can give a full 3%. Okay. Okay, questions from committee members? Well, oh, Representative Horman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, it's good to have you here, President Satterley. Thank you. Can you give us an estimate of the percentage of your uh, faculty and staff that the 3% CEC covers and kind of what portion of your uh, staff that would not be covered by that? President Satterley, feel free to call on staff if, if you need to. Thank you for the lifeline, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Horman, I'm going to guess it's about half. About half, 50%. Further questions from the committee? Well, President Satterley, that brings us to your closing remarks. If, if you wouldn't mind, I see you have a bunch of good folks here from ISU. Would you mind, as part of your closing remarks, uh, introducing them to the committee? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. The floor Mr. is yours. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one of the things that I have found in my now seven months as president of Idaho State University is that there is a core group of very dedicated individuals who support Idaho State University. It's in our community, it's in our alumni, but most importantly, it's in the employees that are there who care deeply. Um, I have discovered that they don't work at Idaho State University for anything other than their dedication to our students, I hear that. I hear that mostly from our students, which is what I love. Our students tell me that the dedication of the faculty and staff to them, they appreciate it and they see it. So I'm very happy to have some of our staff here today. First, I'm gonna introduce our Provost and Executive Vice President, Dr. Laura Woodworth Nye, and our Interim Vice President for Finance, Brian Hickenlooper and our Vice President for the Health Sciences in the Kasiska Division of Health Sciences, Dr. Rex Force. My Chief of Staff, uh, Ms. Danielle Dunstan. Our Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, Selena Grace. And um, someone who is well known in this building and an old colleague of mine for a long time, our Director of Governmental Affairs, Ken Coots. Welcome to each of you. Thank you for traveling clear from East, East Idaho to be here with us today, President. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am <clears throat> overwhelmingly proud. I'm a fourth generation Idaho native. And I'm a first generation college student. And so I know what education can do for a person. Because I wouldn't be sitting here had I not found a way to go on and do what I have done with my life. Um, I'm proud to be president of Idaho State University, and I hope I can do justice to all of your expectations. Thank you. Thank you, President Satterley. I think the state board has chosen well in choosing you, and we're glad to be able to work with you and rub shoulders with you. Thank you. Oh, we do have one question. Would you yield, President? Uh, Senator Nye. Just a comment, if I might. Comments would be in order. I'd like to thank the President for what he does. Would you speak in so we can hear? I'm sorry. I'd, thank I'd you. like to thank the President for what he does for our issue in our region, our state, and um, ask the people here join us in saying, Go Bengals. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dye. Uh, Senator Groh. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, another question. Uh, in your concluding remarks, you, you referred to the uh, medical facility you have out here. And the question I have has to do with residency, how we're getting adequate number of residencies for those students that are there. President Satterley. Mr. Chairman, Senator Groh, the, all of the data is pretty clear on this issue that the 
greatest indicator of where a medical professional will end up setting up practice has to do with where they take their residencies or their clinical sites. And so um, investment in that for the state of Idaho will be one of the leading ways in which we bring more medical providers to the state of Idaho. So any way we can find to continue to add to and increase those opportunities will help Idaho's um, health care shortage. Any further questions? Okay. The ISU uh, budget hearing is concluded, and, and thank you, President Satterley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.